This is another eye raw podcast. I think there opens up a place where where we where we have a lot of a, a lot of these animals that that are just not paid attention to. They they are so much part of the wallpaper of our lives. Welcome to season three of the Animal Turn podcast with me, Claudia Herzenfelder. This season, we're talking all about animals and the urban. And today is episode three, where we're talking about the concept invisibilized animals. Super important concept, and Paula Kari, my guest, is absolutely amazing. But before I introduce her, let's just do a spot of housekeeping. Straight away, I wanted to say I'm sorry that this episode was a bit delayed in coming out. Things have been a bit crazy on my end. Uh, I'm currently moving countries. I'm moving from Canada to Austria and it's the end of semester and I've just kind of been bogged down with grading, literally grading coming out of my eyes and ears at the moment. Uh, So it's just led to a couple of delays. I also wanted to just say thank you at the front of this episode to Animals and Philosophy, Politics, Law and Ethics Apple uh, for sponsoring this podcast. If you haven't checked out their website, you should Jeff. You should definitely go and have a look. There's so much exciting work happening at Apple and uh, they're just wonderful people, wonderful folks. And I just wanted to say a thank you right up front to you guys once again. And a special thank you to Paula Simonik, who's also a member at Apple. She donated her Blue Yeti microphone to me. For those of you who have been listening to the podcast since the beginning, you'll know that in season one and for a big chunk of season two, I was having a lot of sound issues, building myself blanket forts and figuring out a whole variety of ways in which to make my sound better. And uh, Paulina has since given me a microphone and I hope that you've noticed, but things have improved quite a bit. On that note, however... Uh, There are a few sound disruptions in this episode. You'll hear that there's some furniture moving in the background and uh, you're definitely going to hear the distinct sound of a dog shaking their body. You know, when the the collar, the tag on the collar goes... So you're definitely going to hear that. Uh, Sorry, unfortunately, there are some sounds that when recording from home are unavoidable, but it's not too jarring. And I think you're going to hear Paula and myself just fine. Okay. So enough of all of that, let's get to today's episode. Today I'm speaking to Paula Kari, uh, who's a Leverhulme Early Career Research Fellow within the Centre for Human Animal Studies at Edge Hill University in the UK. Her three-year project, The Visual Consumption of Animals, Challenging Persistent Binaries, aims to support transformational change in the ways humans conceive and interact with nature. Before joining Edgehill, Paula worked at the RMIT University in Melbourne on a range of climate change projects and completed her PhD there in 2018. She was primarily interested in the relationship between societal change and stability in relation to climate change and environmental change, as well as how this is part of expropriating nature and involves the oppression of non-human animals. All right, um, hi, Paula. Oh, is, it, is it Paula or Paula? Paula. Paula. Hi, yeah, Paula. Welcome yeah. to the Animal Tone. Thank you. Thanks, Claudia. Is it Claudia uh, or like, Claudia? Yeah, I'm easy either way. By, okay. <laughs> technically Claudia, but I kind of, I've been in too many German circles to kind of notice the difference. Claudia and Claudia, <laughs> um, whichever. Um, it is interesting, right? As soon as you have that AU combination, people aren't quite sure. Um, so yes. Paula and Claudia or Paula and Claudia. Anyway, I'm digressing yes. already in the beginning of the show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's lovely, lovely, lovely to have you on uh, The Animal Turn. And I'm so excited to talk to you about the concept today, which is invisibilized animals. Um, but first, uh, before we get into um, that, I just wanted to actually speak to you a bit about why you think the urban is an important place for us to study when thinking about animals, and maybe how you yourself came to to be interested in the urban as a as a place of consideration. Mm. Um, well, for the it was a place of consideration, I guess, just for. Um, a more recent paper that I've done. My my interest does go more broadly than that. Um, But I guess it started when when I was in Melbourne and there was a a real kind of heightening interest in um, 
in sort of, and I guess it's part of where, because I was living in the city and I was part of a very uh, urban campus, university campus, but there was a lot of work on urban biodiversity, urban nature, conservation, how to get communities concerned with nature. And it, it kind of struck me that there was large numbers of animals because I lived out in a, a, a suburb about maybe 10 kilometers from the center and there were slaughterhouses all around me. And mm-hmm. I was always very conscious um, whenever I was heading out of the city or heading anywhere, I would be passing livestock trucks all the time. And, and so there was just a sort of disconnect for me with um, these kind of feel good romanticized efforts around nature and biodiversity of the city and then that kind of came up against you know these slaughterhouses and like blank um, sterile places of that were hiding violence behind them and then um uh, that made me also, I lived very close to the zoo within walking distance. I moved and mo- moved very close to the zoo. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's another big group of contained animals in our cities and also very close to Flemington racetrack, horse for horse racing. Um, and I, I just, the, the, and then annually there's this bull riding event that tours Australia and goes into the major, into stadiums in the middle of cities. And there's sort of rodeo aspects to that as well. I just started to think about all of these animals that, that, that get caught into, sucked into our urban lives that were excluded from these discussions of nature. Mm-hmm. But I thought they're, they're just equally nature. And, of course, animals in rescue centres as well, um, animals in research centres, the, the, the horse racing animal, the, sorry, the horse carriages, and so that's just really what got me focused on the urban. And even if they aren't located there, the urban is such a transit zone for animals at some point in their kind of commodified lives. They're, they're passing through the city, often in a different form for the case of food animals. But yeah, so that was why I, uh, the nature became a, a focus for me. And also because in... Uh, Eric Schwinsdo, I don't know how to say his name properly, but he There's talks about... There's a lot of W's in that name. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I get confused. He talks about uh, the urban cities as really the catalysts, the, the kind of the places where our activities, the, the metabolism of our activities is sort of centred in cities, even though we draw on the, the rest of the world. It's, it's kind of um, the processes are feeding the, the urban activities really so um, yeah and and was it so was the the urban part of your your PhD work or is this a side project um it kind of came out of that I think like I guess a lot of things do your your thinking starts to move along I had looked at ethical and sustainable meat and I had been interviewing urban participants and I guess the the phenomenon of ethical and sustainable meat and I know that it's it's got a slightly different guise in different parts of the world um, but in Australia there was a particularly a rise in in self-identified um, products and consumers of ethical and sustainable meat it was actually labeled like that and say humane meat or ethical or more sustainable and a lot of that activity is uh, centered on urban food markets and so that's how I approached my consumers and producers because the the urban markets were there where where they exchanged where the exchange went went took place and and where um and where the construction of the ethical was was being performed like yeah. both the ethical meat and the ethical animals so so that so the producers and consumers were sort of meeting in these urban markets when you said sustainable I, I just watched uh sea spiracy i think last week it's busy trending everywhere and kind of starting to question some of these labels and i actually went on a bit of a rant i think with my husband this morning because i saw a massive billboard for i think it was mcdonald's uh or i'm not uh, let me say for for a fast food chain and just a massive picture of a of, of a beef burger and this is also another way in which animals are in our cities, right? As representations of things. 
uh, but like sustainably sourced. And of all the the things to have the word sustainable next to a, a, a beef patty just seemed remarkable. I, I, I didn't know how this was being achieved, like how it was just being so readily accepted, um, that idea. So what, what fascinating work. So your PhD was kind of looking at these ethical interactions. And from that, you realize that there's a really significant and important urban dimension to all of this. Yes, yes. And I, and I guess the urban is also where these, um, the seeds of these sort of ways that meat is reconstituted, I guess the urban is, is, is where that tends to, to emerge. Um, the ethical concerns start to bubble up most mm. in urban cities, I think. It's interesting what you last said. Um, I was just emailing with a colleague uh, in Australia this morning, and she was saying how now in America that that reconstitution of meat in response to public concerns has shifted to antibiotic use. So now you're yeah. getting meat labeled as um, antibiotic free. As not, yes, mm -hmm. yes. So, it's it's and, and it's, so there, there are these just like interesting things I'm, I'm in Canada at the moment and it seems to be kind of the fact that the meat is Canadian is really important uh the fact that it's antibiotic free and the fact that it's sustainable um just comes up again and again which yeah it's it's interesting to think to think through uh so were you always interested in in animals and how they how they interact in your research or is this what you know what was your pathway to getting to animals I, I, um it's relatively recent um uh, uh, you know I, I kind of feel um i came to it too late as as i guess many people do that they wish they, their light had switched on earlier um but i really started mind you i've been vegetarian since i was 16 um and that was for what I, that was for ethical reasons, but um, my ethics had had just went to that limit of of dairy for 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 a long time till I was in my thirties, um, and I studied climate and um, climate change, environmental science. That was my background, and I worked in climate change adaptation and mitigation for um, for a few years, and it was. It was increasingly the case that the groups of people I was working for um, weren't vegetarian. There was maybe a couple of us in groups of 30 or 40 that were vegetarian. And yet this was the time when um, the contribution of animal agriculture to climate change and environmental change was was really quite um, irrefutable. Mm -hmm. um, and yet I, I just saw a, a, a kind of wall that went up that that wasn't part of what we did we we did greenhouse gas emissions from from utilities and we did um transport um and we also looked at water but 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 the but food but the sustainability of food was maybe part of it but not not and not animal agriculture mm -hmm. and in one of the institutes i was at um there was uh colleague there in a different area doing her own funded research she was funded by voiceless actually in australia and she was doing this um qualitative research showing people pictures of factory farming and, and eliciting their response and, and i actually had no idea that this kind of research was possible i think i just came from such a quantitative hard science background um, that i hadn't really thought about qualitative research I didn't really know that was possible it was amazing to me so it was a bad time for climate change research as, as I guess it is for was for many kind of research centers around 2010 around that time and our funding kind of dried up and many of us went on to do PhDs and I just I, my mind had sort of been opened up by this world of critical animal studies that I didn't know about. And, and it just felt like my, my space, mm. um, I, I had, I just discovered it. And so I went, went for it. I like mm. what you say there. Cause I, I have definitely noticed, um, a similar tension myself. Uh, one of the beauties of geography is geography does somewhat straddle this kind of qualitative quantitative divide. So sometimes in the same department, you'll have people that are working on, you know, greenhouse gases and doing very technical things that, you know, speak in a language I don't quite understand. 
And sometimes us from the social side will stand up and we start using words, which we'll talk a bit about uh, later in the episode, like entanglement and relationality that they struggle to understand. But at the very least, we're in the same room or at the same buildings where we're able to start to share some of these ideas, which is really important. But I have been somewhat startled by how often I speak to folks that are doing climate change uh, research that are at the forefront of looking at the Arctic and global warming, uh, who have not thought about or even had animal agriculture as part of their syllabi. Um, you know, how this forms part of all of these processes seems to be not only invisibilized in cities, but invisibilized in the way we even understand these massive uh, problems. And it, I'm obviously speaking very broad brushstrokes here, but uh, I've just been quite surprised at the leaders, the people that are, are knowledge generators about this, not having any sort of and I'm not even just speaking here about ethical stand. I'm speaking about kind of the ecological impacts of animal agriculture here. It's quite yes, yes, exactly. When we talk, um, uh, the last paper I wrote with Fiona Proben Ratsi and Haley Singer, we we touched on that in terms of the climate movement often being quite resistant to having any sort of animal message brought in. Um, and I guess part of it is fear of alienating some of their support base. Um, so that's partly it. But I think there's also um, the invisibilization is is kind of kind of can be understood in different ways. And I think it's it's that kind of that invisibilization as a process that I'm kind of interested in. So it's not that things are are or are not visible but it's it's how they're re rendered kind of discursively and conceptually and as part of epistemically and I think what you were just talking about for me um points to that epistemic invisibility so that so the way our systems of knowledge have been built around um the naturalization of the subordinated status of animals like it's just set up as a as a natural a natural state of being, um, much like other um, subordinated humans, are, are their subordination is naturalized. It's the same for animals that it's it's just construed as a as a natural thing, um, and that it 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 suffuses all our systems of of knowledge. And they determine how animals can be understood and made sense of in our everyday practices. And so that's a kind of, and that's a structural invisibility. It goes through all of our, all of our societies at every level and dimension, law, policy, governance, education, media, religion, families. Um, it, it, and it's, it's, it normalizes their constitutions as functional like based on their function their utilitary function so it normalizes those constitutions so that they are effectively invisible in any other in any other way if that makes yeah i'm sense. happy you brought up your your paper there um so and, and this is what we're going to talk about today kind of invisibilized animals and i think you bring a lot of these tensions out uh let me make sure I get the name correct. Uh, where species don't meet invisibilized animals, urban nature, and city limits. Now, I thought this was an incredibly provocative um, paper, but you weren't really you were you were saying you were saying I think things that everybody should know and and things that people should question. So perhaps you could tell us maybe uh, before I start asking. Um, questions about some of the concepts there. What was the premise of this paper? Um, what was the, you did a massive literature review, uh, but what was the main premise behind this this paper? It it started off uh, as, uh, I guess, what I was saying earlier, kind of observation about this body of, of literature around entanglement and, mm. and at human animal relations. And relations is always, is always understood in that positive way like a relation is always almost assumed to be reciprocal. Um, it's always understood as sort of something a bit benign or benevolent. But, I mean, it's not always, but that's the dominant understanding of a relation. Um, and I felt that there was something, um, the, the critical side was missing from these sort of articulations of, of careful 
more ethical human human relations with nature mm-hmm. that I felt was uh, kind of skating over commodified relations. It was they were talking about wildlife and nature, but again, that the 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 very violent and uh, and problematic relations we have with commodified animals were sidelined yeah. or uh, I think we say offstaged in the paper. Is the title of your paper, Where Species Don't Meet, is that a tip or a tip of the hat or a challenge to the title When Species Meet from Donna Haraway's book? Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, I mean... Mm. She, she popularized or, or contributed greatly to this kind of idea of entanglement and we're in relation uh, what you're talking about here um and i think so yeah maybe we can talk a little bit about entanglement how so you say entanglement's being used in this kind of really positive way that if you're in relation with someone it's good and i think that there has been a lot of value i think from animal studies in highlighting this and trying to say that firstly we need to recognize that we are in relationship with animal it's not animals it's not just this um static thing where animal is a thing and we just happen to be in the same space but actually how we understand ourselves and how they understand themselves is born of a relationship um and i think that that is a valuable thing to to know i think a lot of people maybe don't even don't even go that far maybe with their own dogs and cats they would appreciate that there's a relationship but they don't necessarily think that they're in relation with the squirrel that hangs out in their tree or the raccoon that burrows in their roof. Um, So, but I think I get what you're saying here though, is that there is this kind of positive slant of saying, once we recognize that we're entangled, something good will happen and we will look after these animals. We'll say, okay, we are in relation. We use the same spaces. So how can we develop better policies for those animals? But we've tended to focus very much on kind of these urban wildlife animals or liminal animals like squirrels and raccoons. And I guess the, the question then comes, how do we, are, 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 are cows and pigs and chickens not part of nature? Uh, are, they, are they not part of the city? Because we don't see them in many North American cities. And I'm assuming in, what is it like in Australia? Are you likely to see uh, pigs and cows and chickens in your cities? No, uh, much the same as, as as Britain as well, where I am now. And um, yeah, I mean, like most places, they're contained. If they're in part of extensive systems, then they're in rural rural areas. But if they're part of more intensive systems, some sometimes they're located in, um, in close to urban centres, like not far from where I am now. There's a, a large egg laying um big sheds of of laying hens that are just invisible to the outside they're just these sterile sheds so yeah they're 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 mostly they're mostly invisible but i i i'm not sure if i'm going to be able to um if i'm i keep forgetting what your what their question was but um sorry i tend to lower guess... way too much into it <laughs> I think, I think I think it's more a matter of kind of this this idea. So you mentioned nature, right? Um, mm-hmm. And and I think when we speak about entanglement, we tend to privilege specific types of animals, uh, but we tend to exclude other animals. So in your research, what are you finding in terms of the animals who are included in our way of thinking about urban entanglements and the animals that are excluded? Mm-hmm. Which animals are included mm. in this, and and which which are kind of left out? Well, it, it, in if we're talking about the the particular sort of conservation biology urban studies sort of framework, it, it is it does tend to be the animals con- conceived as wild, um, native, common cell. It can even extend to the stray and the feral and the pest, but it is definitely the more commodified animals that are that whose whose use is just part of our everyday lives, that they're not not as visible as as something to problematize. Mm-hmm. Um, that seems to be more left to animal advocacy um, to speak on their behalf. It seems to be a different can a diff- relegated to a different set of concerns and, and even just not viewed as as problematic. I mean, even 
and what you were saying about relations and entanglements and going back to to Donna Haraway, I mean, the, the, relationship, the, the relationship with her working dogs that she describes, um, that like pets is another area where the sorts of entanglements that are taken for granted need to be problematized as well. I mean, we have all these shelters that are part of our urban landscapes and sort of what that means and the implications of them tend to not get discussed as as the while well, the dominant narrative is sort of a especially in the UK is sort of as a nation of of pet lovers and um and yet these industries the, the pet industry it is a huge industry that that churns out and and encourages breeders to um to keep supplying these animals and new animals into a market that's kind of based on the commodification of companionship and affection and even status and entertainment, um, that doesn't get problematized as much either. So even, even pets, but I mean, I was going to mention the racing industries and, and the zoo industry and say animals for research. I mean, these are the ones that aren't, aren't as visible but it even extends to to the relations that are the relations the relationships that are viewed as probably the most benign and benevolent like like pet keeping um i mean it's interesting that in most countries keeping native animals as pets is illegal but you can have an exotic pet um so which is strange that is that is interesting um when when you're speaking about invisibilized animals here, are we talking about specific species or animals? Or are we speaking about the invisibilization of specific forms of relationships? So, you know, could you have in, in the literature, and, and here we're primarily speaking, I guess, about how animals have been invisibilized in academic literature, uh, in, in animal studies in general. But in so you could have a rat who's conceivably part of what we've categorized as a pest and has come up quite a lot in literature and in thinking about cities and the ways in which cities are ecologies and natures. But you might also very well have a rat who's in a laboratory and that relationship is invisible. So it's not so much that rats themselves are invisible in all the literature as much as it is that form of relationship that uh that 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 is invisible and and the more invisible it is the yeah what 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 does that invisibility of that relationship then mean uh, is it a matter of once we make it visible things will be good yeah no i think that's um that's a good point that i i wanted to make at some point and you reminded me um yeah it's 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 important to to sort of question that like take, like visual concealment like it it does contribute to the conceptual and moral invisibility um in the, in terms of so when you speak of the, the the popular conception of um of slaughterhouses and animal animal farms being outside of cities and invisible and of research animals being being invisible so actual visual visual concealment does contribute to some extent to that conceptual and moral invisibility um but the particularly with the advance of technologies i think we actually need to trouble the what that implies which is that the greater visibility then you'd have positive change you know that kind of ties in with that old uh, linda mccartney's thing of having glass if slaughterhouses glass mm -hmm. had glass walls and because I think we need to question that particularly with with the increasing visual technologies that have been um allowing most people over the last sort of 20 years to to if if they choose to but it can be hard to avoid but, but to be at least aware of the of the realities of a lot of these industries they're much less um they're much more transparent now um that the, the activities are much less hidden. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's different types of visibility. Like you were saying, it's, it's the, it's the, 
it's the it's different types of, in, of visibilization. It's not just the literal, what, I'm, what I would say is literal and visibility. Um, so I would identify probably probably three other, at least three other kinds of invisibility. Um, so you've got that epistemic invisibility that I mentioned before, like you, our, our knowledge systems that, um, that just do not see them as anything other than their utilitarian designation. So as, as food animals, as pets, as entertainment. So that's, that's their function. Um, and then you've also got, um, what I would call as part of that is a kind of ontological invisibility. So the, the kind of way that they're in, invisibilized in our knowledge systems, it actually precludes these animals having any self-directed ways of being, um, kind of undermines the idea that they are subjects of their own lives and parts of communities that aren't governed by humans. So you might think of, of von Uxkull's concept of Umwelt, which you'll be familiar with. Um, so the, the idea that these animals, if they weren't subjected to human will, they would have lives that were their own to determine. They'd have free will and agency. They would have the ability to not relate to us, to leave a relation, to be something other than our perception and value of them. But, but we have removed that possibility. That so I would I would refer to that as a kind of ontological invisibility. They haven't got their own presence or futures, um, and that applies to most commodified animals in our our world right now. Uh, if I can go, say like another aspect of this, like bringing in a couple of other authors, but that aspect of them being severed from their communities. And it's not just those that have been taken from their natural habitats that I'm kind of thinking of here, but it includes captive bred and domesticated animals who progressively with each generation, they're kind of cut off from the inherited knowledge and instincts that kind of makes them what they are. And Deborah Bird Rose, Rose, Rose describes this as a sort of double death where you have entire generations of living things and connectivities that are being destroyed. And she drew one of, one of her ideas from um, a guy called James Hatley who speaks about genocide and species extinction as enocide. And he similarly describes the kind of wiping out of entire generations that would have kind of carried forward their their memories. Um, so this so this this way that we've kind of erased animals' own self directed ways of being, I, I, it, it's it's kind of amounting to a progressive ontological invisibility. We can't see any other way of life for them I and mean, it kind of gets summed up in that common response you get from people as um what would happen to all the animals you know what would happen to all the animals if we didn't use them as food or if we didn't use them in this way what else would they be i have to almost smile because it does that comes up so often kind of even there's almost a lack of imagination that cows might have something other to do than to stand in their own filth waiting for us to eat them. You know, <laughs> maybe yeah. there's something else out there for cows and chickens. Uh, maybe they have different agendas. Uh, you mentioned that there are three three types of invisibilities. You said uh, epistemic, epistemic, yes, yeah. ontological, yeah. and was the other um, um, representational? Yeah. Well, I would. There's probably about five. I think it's probably five. <laughs> so you've got, your, you've got the. Yeah, it's hard, and because it's it's not really a, a um a definite system, and then these are just kind of way different ways of thinking about it that kind mm. of indicate there's different things going on here. So I think there's the question of the literal, the question of the literal visibility, mm. um, which which I'm saying doesn't always doesn't always correlate with with moral visibility you know the yeah. more visible they are the more um the better they'll be treated because um as i don't i won't yeah, linger too long i'll keep moving on 
Yeah. Yes, so, like like his, Timothy Pacharat and a couple of others have also have already pointed out that like sec- sequestration and sight can coexist. Like mm-hmm. animals can be subjectified within their systems of, of objectification. We, we're quite yeah. okay with that. Um, so that's probably the most common way of thinking about visibility in terms of that literal visibility. But then what you described earlier and what what we come into contact with most every day is the discursive invisibility. What, and Carol Adams' notion of the absent referent is mm-hmm. probably the most... Um, uh kind of accessible notion of that how language and um and discourse and images are used to effectively kind of make the the living breathing animal invisible but also what's done to them becomes invisible kind of shrouded in this this veil of of happy words and yeah euphemistic words and and animated happy images so that's one type of discursive invisibility. And what you've been asking me about, like words like nature and a- other aggregate, aggregate terms like biodiversity and non-human, they also work discursively to kind of exclude certain animals or just be vague about it. But then you have, as I was saying, the euphemistic terms used to describe certain things that are done to animals like euthanasia or culling Mm -hmm. um and a friend the other day mentioned that yes yes and a Mm -hmm. friend the other day mentioned that when people go fishing they buy what are called landing mats to be more friendly to the fish so that they don't suffer on the ground so they're called so interesting landing the kind of the cognitive dissonance that we I mean and we've all done it I was you know I was quite proud of the, the amount of meat I would eat and kind of the interactions I'd have. Uh, in South Africa, we would frequently go to, uh, and again, thinking kind of about the relationship between the city and what's outside of the city is we would frequently leave Johannesburg to go on a game drive just outside of the city to marvel at, I take it for granted, like I realized how much I took it for granted when I was in South Africa, now that I'm out, where we had access to seeing elephants, giraffes, zebra. And we would spend hours in our cars watching these animals, marveling at them, only to go back to our campsites and eat meat that had been (laughs) bought from a supermarket in the store, right? And this kind of shows those flows as well. So the the, the flesh, the meat had come from somewhere. We bought it in a supermarket, um, completely removed from the animal very little thought about it being an animal was just a steak picked that up took it outside of the city again sat in a place that we all went to because we love nature Uh, and 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 you can have these ambivalent feelings at exactly the same time you're like yes I, i love nature animals are amazing they're awe inspiring look at look at that elephant as he walks up the the road and blocks all the cars and just takes charge of that space and you think yes animals are amazing and we're all busy marveling at how awesome animals are as we we chomp on a, a chop and we eat a steak <laughs> and uh it's yeah it's 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 just it's interesting how you 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 do have that kind of barrier that barrier to thinking of these animals but also in a very material sense how they relate to the city in very different ways. That elephant in the park is very differently. I think that elephant in the park is still in relationship to Johannesburg, is still impacted by whatever goes on in Johannesburg. But the cow that I'm eating had a very different relationship with the city. And which of these relationships are actually being understood? Uh, Which of these relationships are we being and having enough courage to unpack and question? Yes, and and actually there's... there's when you delve deeper there is actually crossover between these separate um separate conceptions of animal use um and i i kind of like to draw attention to that uh, animal industrial complex aspect of things that that does when you start to pick them apart they are not so separate because of course as you'll know many people um there is an underground market for game meat um across across the world and zoo animals are often fed to each other when they die and the the the, so the lines between consumable and and sort of game or entertainment or spectacle they 
they start to to blur um, a, across all of the industries. You can draw lines between the wildlife trade, the exotic pet trade, entertainment, food, hunting for meat. It, they, the lines all start to cross, and you can have the same animal even crossing between different ones. You know, a racehorse can 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 shift into becoming meat and greyhounds can shift from becoming entertainment to pet but they can also shift to, to also becoming meat and um yeah but i was when i was thinking about the the sort of different materials and technologies that have that are also made invisible when just in the normalization of the kind of use of animals um the 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 kind of as we were saying the violence that's done to them to gets gets hidden behind these sort of euphemistic representations of their lives and what we do so i was saying that the the you've got the literal invisibility and the discursive invisibility but i think what what underpins them is the epistemic invisibility and the ontological invisibility but so just to confuse things i think there's a there's also like interweaving through those because of course like binary systems of, of inequality they're they're um they're of course hierarchical there's there's different levels of inequality and there's different sort of hierarchies of visibility as well so some some animal uses get accorded more moral concern um, than others. So particularly now, I would say in the advocacy space, um, animal agriculture is certainly uh, uh, quite prominent and food animals get talked about in their, in their sort of the billions that are killed each year and the, the acute and acute suffering Animals that suffer very visibly and acutely physically are often very prominent. But what I would say are perhaps less visible or should be just as morally visible but aren't are other types of suffering, the like psychological and also ontological suffering. Again, um, so... I, so the suffering of animals that are kind of dislocated from kin or prevented from experiencing any kind of stability or community for their entire lives can be 15, 20, 30 years or longer, I think should, should be considered just as morally significant as those of, of animals that are produced and killed so much more quickly in their billions. But for the individual animals, um, the, the experience of physical psychological or ontological suffering is is just as equal and yet morally i would say what's done to food animals receives more concern not that it's been having much effect but um i think i think there's a risk that we that in in sort of not paying attention to these other other forms of suffering, we're sort of saying that there are relate there are certain relations and uses of animals that that can be benign and benevolent. Mm -hmm. And so, if we just made the way we treat food animals more like that, then then use per se is not the problem. Yes, yeah, so I guess that also underpins a lot of uh, kind of welfare ways of thinking about animals. Um, so. I guess what you're saying here is there's a problem in kind of creating a poster child out of these relationships. So we're using our human relations with uh, agricultural animals as a kind of poster child for trying to understand many of our problematic relationships with animals that need to be better visibilized, better made uh, visible and also understood, whether they be the ways in which we watch them, the ways in which we keep them in our homes. Uh, how How do these relationships uh, impact the animals physically and acutely the way you mentioned, but also their sense of self, the sense to which they're able to actually navigate the world and be, um, how does this actually alter their worlds? And there are many ways in which this manifests. And I think eating them is one. 
but as you said right in the beginning uh, and here again you know how they're kept in zoos how they're kept in aquariums how they are managed in homes uh, in laboratories these are all spaces worthy of consideration but something you've brought up in almost all of these spaces that seems to cut across is the idea of commodification that like commodification is somehow central to both the ways in which they're made invisible but also the reasoning for why they're invisible uh, or why they're even in these relationships in the first place. So perhaps mm -hmm. um, we could just spend a little bit of time talking about that. What what is what do we mean when we say commodification? What are we talking about here? And what is its relationship with this kind of invisibility tension? Mm. Um, well, I'm not a, I'm not a huge expert on on kind of Marx theory, but uh, commodification is, is when the um, a, a certain a certain value is put on a on a quality of 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 an animal, a monetary value. So, it, some aspect of that animal's way of being, whether it's to do with their body or their their living body or their dead body, is is seen as as of value. To it, ha, it is it is assigned some value by by us as humans because we see something in it that we can we derive benefit from whether that's as food or as pleasure or entertainment and um, and so that aspect of the animal its ability to whether it's it, its ability to metabolize food in order to grow bigger or its ability to run fast or its ability to to look a certain way or act a certain way towards us that that is commodified and translated into a, a monetary exchange value and that, so the animals are reduced to nothing but a financial a financial game yes to what extent can we extract yes. financial value from you your body or what you can do yes and and so as soon as that that enters into it then the the equation becomes about producing as much of that Mm -hmm. as you can while reducing the, the costs surrounding it. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the critical so then, failure. Of, sorry. No, you go. I was going to say, yeah, this is just the, I guess, the critical failure of, of capitalism, no matter whether you're looking at it from an ecological vantage point or a social one. Uh, and there I'm talking about humans and animals, that if you're constantly trying to just produce more, 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 what are the, what are the ramifications of that? Yes. And, oh. yes, and that profit imperative, it it's, it's infuses everything, every sort of use, even ones that, that people view as benign, and that's the fundamental problem that, um, that should be as equal focus as, say, the suffering of animals or, or, or the physical suffering, I should say, um, because it's, uh, it, it's, um, what we're trying to say that so the that commodification it 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 just drives the production of more life as much life as possible so that the the value can be can be taken out mm -hmm. um, the best value can be taken out so you see it in the racing industries and uh, horse racing and greyhound racing um, uh, uh, an expose here a few years ago um, exposed that about a third of greyhounds born every year are are killed um or culled as they will the industry will say um and many in the same happen it's about the same proportion in horse racing um because so many of them just do not make the grade that to 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 arrive at the few that are profitable you, you just have to go through um so many who are just not considered um valuable and many of those simply this is another aspect of the literal literal invisibility many of those do simply disappear mm. because there's such a big gap between those born and those actually registered there's a huge shortfall and they're simply they simply disappear and they're not traceable and the same profit so thing goes sad. yeah the same goes for for zoos and breeding programs because they they can't breed from the same kind of genetic genetically connected stock for too long they have to go through regular culling killing each year 
so just in European zoos alone, there's about um, I think there's about four or five, four to five thousand animals that are killed every year just for just as part of keeping the genetic lines pure. Um, and that's just in Europe. That just that's just in registered European mm. zoos, not not unregistered ones. So there's a lot of invisible kind of management going on behind yeah. the scenes of sort of perceptive per, kind of industries that are perceived as as benign or or even actually positive. Mm. But yes. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes when I have a conversation with folks about zoos, oftentimes this kind of breeding program will be brought up. You know, zoos are investing a lot of resources into understanding these animals. They're investing a lot of money into conservation. And I think what you're talking about here is kind of what is the motive behind whatever this relationship is? And if the motive is profit, what does this mean? Uh, how does profit drive the actions? And if the motive is conservation, what does this mean and how does it actually manifest in the relationships that we see? And as you spoke about there, if it's genetics, if genetics is the goal, what does this mean for the actual relationships? Who are the individuals that are getting, you know, pushed around? How much semen is being sold and to who? How are bodies being shipped across the world and across cities? Uh, because it's not just actual animals themselves that are moved, but then parts of them become valued. Uh, Yes. I do bits of reading about cows and I'm just, I'm, you have to marvel at how much more valuable in, in a profit sense the semen of a bull is than an entire cow uh, and the different, yeah, and, and even those are just kind of invisible. The sexualized relationships of, this is something Catherine Gillespie does really well, yeah. where she kind of talks about the, the sexualized relationships of, of animals I'm going off on a tangent. I apologize. No, uh, no, you're not. I was going to. I was going to mention some similar things that happen to the the greyhounds and the race, the horses that are used for racing that I've that I've tracked as well. Similar things happen. Their life trajectories. Um, they they for for instance, they can go through many different trainers just in two three years, eight nine trainers, but then at some point in their lives, the question of what their value is. They're no longer valued for racing, and so often it's their their breeding becomes the next valued uh, commodity. And so, the, yes, and their their semen can be frozen. It can be used um, after they've gone on to another use. One dog I was following ended up being shipped to China for breeding, but but his semen was used here in in the UK and Ireland for for a, a, for a while after he'd gone. So there's this sort of invisible trace of these animals, um, like uh, yeah, the, it's the... it's. I mean, we we straddle it. I, I find it infinitely interesting and and infinitely sad at exactly the same time <laughs> because at, at no point is this horse or this dog or this cow being viewed as a horse or a dog or a cow who has any sort of life of their own, who has their own life history. And uh, if you start to pay attention to what that life history is, I think it gets um, gets crushing. But you're speaking here also, I think, really about trying to understand and make visible not just specific animals, but problematizing some of these relationships and what that act of problematizing them does, how it works to make um, both the animals and some of these relationships visible. Uh, I have... Mm. Um, Two, two more questions before we head over to your, your quote. And uh, the first one is just trying to bring the urban back into this. So we've, I think mm. we've unpacked now a fair bit about how uh, this works to make both animals as, as physical, lively beings absent, as well as the relationships we have with them invisible. But why is, why is focusing on the urban in particular for for animal studies scholars why why should the urban in particular be a space where they concentrate their efforts uh, why is this of particular concern um well i think i can only speak for for what 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 i notice uh, um and what is i guess is a is a concern for me and others might disagree but i think as i said at the beginning i think the urban is a, a place where um, where we where we have a lot of a, a lot of these animals that um, that are just not 
paid attention to. They, they are so much part of the wallpaper of our lives. And I think these relations need to be examined just as much as, as relations el elsewhere that are, that are problematized. I, I guess it's part of that odd equation of, um, of thinking that greater visibility will lead to more concern when it's actually conversely just as true that often it's very invisible relations with with a nature that's on the other side of the world that is actually given more more moral weight and yet it's in cities that some of the most undesirable aspects of our relations with with animals are, are, exist like there's so many research um like academic research centers, whether it's um, schools of medicine, university departments and medical research centers, there's so many hundreds of thousands of animals that are that are hidden behind those doors. You've got your your rescue centers, as I said, and and racing tracks and zoos. So the presence of, of all of these very um, non-native animals within our cities is is not considered uh unusual or it, or it's considered just as part of everyday life mm. but i think we need to start thinking about those relations differently in order to start unsettling the whole kind of foundation of what we think of as as a healthy mm -hmm. um relationship so it's almost starting with our everyday instead of these these relations that are all, almost kept a bit distance from us like it, oh it's the it's the food animals and it's nature and we've got to help the the stop the deforestation in amazon it's like bringing it a lot a lot closer yeah I and and i i think i mean i i do think that food animals are, are really important i think that that does come to the the everyday that you're talking about it's kind of the taken for granted everyday thing that you do you you eat three times a day. It's mm -hmm. something you take for granted. You put on makeup. How are animals uh, implicated in that makeup? You go on a day trip to the zoo. What does this mean? And just as you were speaking, I was thinking again, and I think it's going to come up a lot in the season, is this idea of the city being a human space. And we we kind of constantly reinforce this idea. The city is human, even though we we, you know, you think for a minute and you realize, yes, okay, there are other animals here. But I think the extent to which there are just other animals here is not really appreciated. And I, it would be fascinating to see a census document of an urban area that included other animals, where you actually got a sense of how many animals are we really talking about in this urban space? If we were to calculate all of the lab, the, the lab rats and the monkeys in the labs and the animals in the zoos and, you know, the backyard chickens and the dogs and the cats and, and just the live animals in, in a city that are kept in some way. In the, the previous episode, I spoke to uh, Nicholas uh, Delon about the idea of pervasive captivity, that animals are just kind of kept in, in a variety of different ways. And even those that are not forcibly kept in some way end up relying on the urban as a, as a space. But imagine if we created a document that was able to actually highlight these, these animals and kind of give a true sense of just how animal a city is and that we could start to look at these relationships um, mm, I tried to I tried to do that for the paper I looked at Melbourne just greater Melbourne and I tried to do that for um for various industries the horse racing greyhound slaughterhouses I sort of tried to I drew on various documents and tried to provide a an idea of just how many animals we were talking about and originally I really wanted to sort of start doing it for lots of cities mm. um but yeah, so I try to do it just from Melbourne. And was it a hard activity to just get these numbers to figure it out? Yes, yes, it can be. It can be really hard, especially for for animal research labs. Um, there, there can be so many of them that that you don't know about, and um, and then ha and the pet. As I come back to the pet industry, but that's one of those. For me, I'm starting to realize the pet industry is just one of the biggest black boxes. Mm. Because you can't actually, unlike others where where undercover footage is starting to emerge and and um, some industries have to make annual reports. I mean, what goes on behind people's doors is 
totally unknown. And I was reading the other day that um, in the UK, there's 9 million dogs, pet dogs, apparently. Um, but they, a conservative estimate says that there's about 7 million reptiles. And that's only reptiles. So the, the volume of exotic pets um, and, and the lives that they lead behind people's doors mm -hmm. and, and the, the networks and trade routes that they're caught up in, that's, that's another aspect of the urban. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess and what, what does the urban owe to them as animals now? Once they enter, once they're there, is it really only just a matter of welfare policy? Uh, yeah, it's, it's hard. That's it's definitely hard and it's definitely uh, complicated. Could you have uh, do you have a quote that we could uh, listen to and uh, chat about for a little bit before we close up? Yeah. So in terms of yeah quotes, I actually chose two, and one of them I used in in my book on ethical and sustainable meat, and and it still just has such a resonance for me. It's from a, a book of fiction by Emma Gein, and the book's called The Many Selves of Catherine North. And in this book, she the book is about her imagining a sort of world where tourism has reached such a, a has become so technologized that people can actually travel in other animals' bodies, so they can have a phenomenological experience in other animals' bodies. And so, what one line that she says is, "Other subject subjectivities aren't a consumer item." Their habitats aren't playgrounds. And so that Damn. for me just kind of sums up everything. Could, um, could you say it one more time? I mean, that, that whole concept of that book is mind boggling. Can you say it one yes. more time? Um, the quote? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, it's other subjectivities aren't a consumer item. Their habitats aren't playgrounds. Yeah, it does. I think it's speaking yeah. to the trivialization, right? The trivialization of a being or of where their home is um that's beautiful mm. and you said our sense of entitlement i bet i guess it speaks to that for me is our our just sense of absolute entitlement to to invade and uh, appropriate their lives mm. whenever it suits us yeah that's that's powerful you said you had a, a second one for us Yes, and this one's from Dinesh Wadiwal, and I guess it, it, it speaks more to that idea of the of invisibility um, and the normalization of of violence towards animals. But but uh, and in using the word violence, I'm thinking of violence more broadly than mm -hmm. just sort of physical acts. But so he says in his book, The War on Animals, The War Against Animals, he says, we live in a world where violence towards animals is configured as non-violence and where forms of violence are rendered as beneficent. So yeah. that, yeah. And and yeah, and what type of violence is acceptable or not acceptable? This came up a lot in season one when we were speaking about animals and the law. You can't inflict unnecessary harm on an animal. That's it. Uh, but what con what is constituted as necessary or unnecessary. And this came up a lot yes. in the legal episodes, how the idea of necessity is really blurry and vague and used in a variety of ways to use animals' lives in any way we want. We can use it as long yeah. as we somehow figure out, is it necessary to know their DNA and their genetics? Yes. So we can, you know, we can invade their reproductive lives. Is it necessary to make money so that our economies stay afloat? Yes, so we can do with animals whatever we like. As long as, as long as we can find a clever way to make what we do to them necessary, then, yeah. um, and and again, mm, as we a, the 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 the, ano, the recent animals manifesto that was made um, produced in relation to as a response to COVID, um, as part of United. The, the environment day last year i think it used similar language it said it separated essential from non-essential animal uses and that was a manifesto that was signed on by um a multitude of welfare and rights organizations uh, mostly welfare organizations but yes it had that same idea of essential and non-essential use and you have to ask yourself like what does that work do and uh, like i'm sorry what do those words do and for who um because yeah. 
yeah, need is not as definitive as we might like to think. Need and what we think we need is also a socially constructed thing. Um, and in thinking about cities as well, you know, what do cities need and how do we view cities as growing in the future? And what do we imagine our future cities need? And uh, something I know you'd mentioned in the papers, there's a lot of talk now about like, green spaces and creating urban gardens and, you know, trying to reanimate the, the city. Uh, but what do, what do not only future cities, but cities and the environments that they're in relationship with need is actually a really open question. Yeah. yeah. It's again, it's part of that discursive process of, of invisibilizing certain, not just certain animals, but certain ways of thinking about them. It, mm. it, it provides a, a ready a ready narrative that excludes other ways of thinking about them. So, so critical thoughts kind of curtailed. It's not always easy to think a new thought. It does require some struggle and some discomfort and kind of um, that if it's easy to understand and comprehend, maybe there's a point at which you need to stop and say, okay, why is this so easy? Why am I so readily willing to accept what this narrative is, what this idea is? Um, and that maybe in, you know, in, in, in looking at, like you said earlier, looking at kind of the taken for granted every day, you start to realize that we have a script that we we kind of just go along with. And only once we start to turn and look at that script, whether it's on ourselves or the institutions that we're part of, and we see that uncomfortable thing and we have to struggle with it, maybe there is the space for new thought or new ways of, of potentially conceiving our worlds and our cities. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, I was going to say something similar right at the beginning of the interview. I forgot, but the the, the idea that focusing on invisibilization, it's it, it hopefully it's shining, kind of illuminating these kind of shadow spaces, because I think we need that as a constant check on these dominant narratives, like you're saying, like challenge, challenging that normalized way of thinking. And I think, mm. like looking at these shadow spaces can to some extent guard against that it kind of stirs up notions of what's acceptable or normalized um well, yeah maybe guards against some of that the potential of some perverse outcomes of of thinking that of thinking well if invisibility is is has led to this perhaps more visibility will will solve mm. it and i don't think that's that's not that's been proven to not necessarily be the case yeah. so i think you you need to be more careful and and really look at what what is happening yeah sometimes the answer isn't just obvious but uh, the process of questioning what currently exists might be yeah and it can it can feel like you're being a cassandra sometimes and and sort of a why you know if something's good and yet you've pointed out the bad thing about it but but i don't see it as that i see it as as um as seeing it as we could be better like this is fine, but we're still not including them. So mm -hmm. we, we need to, it's not criticizing, it's just seeing room to, to bring more along and see how the conceptualizations could be improved. Mm. Um, I love that. Uh, before, before I say goodbye to you today, I just want to give you an opportunity um, to maybe tell folks about what you're working on right now and maybe point them to a, a a place they can get in touch with you if they're interested in your work so if people do want to check out my work um at the moment um i moved here a year ago on a fellowship looking at um i was sp particularly interested in looking at spec what i'm calling spectacularized animals so i was going to look at uh, at the way animals are um are visually consumed. So I've, I've, I guess I looked at the literal consumption in my last project and I'm kind of interested in their visual consumption there. So I was looking at, at greyhound racing, horse racing, zoos and agricultural shows as spaces where people go to, um, to sort of have certain conceptions about of animals affirmed. And I see the, these are spaces where those conceptions are continually reinforced. So I was interested in understanding how these 
spaces are constituted and how the animals that are used in them are constituted by the people that go so how visitors understand and make sense of the animals mm. what it is about them that they like watching um and i guess how how they what function that activity serves in their lives and so i had a whole load of research outcomes planned i was going to visit the sites and look at the infrastructures of control and containment um because that's another aspect of, of visibility that i didn't raise is is the all the invisible tools and techniques of control and containment that are an aspect of most of the animals we've talked about lives that, that i was going to be looking at all of those those techniques and infrastructures at each of the sites the tethers the cages the ramps Mm-hmm. um the, the hours and like, mm-hmm. yes and looking at the actual time the, the actual um, experience of the animal how many hours they spend in different places who they come into contact with what's their experience how, how far do they travel uh, so I was looking at all of that but of course with COVID it just um just cancelled mm. a huge element of my of my research but I have been speaking to to people that visited these sites, at least before lockdown and sometimes during for zoos, kind of planning to to speak to people involved in the background of the industry to get a better sense of of what the the routine what the routinized lives of these animals actually is, sort of the mm. mundaneness. So that's that's another aspect of invisibility that um, that I, well, that I hadn't really thought about now, but where the the really prominent aspects of some lives are are focused on sort of the animal uh, anim, animals used in agriculture and their abuse and mistreatment. I started to become interested in in that routinized yeah. suffering that that just the hours that they spend. For example, greyhounds are legally allowed to be left for twenty three hours with no human contact, and the zoo animals that I've been watching those six hours that they're open to the public that all the other hours of their days that they spend in these spaces is largely invisible where they came from is also not not questioned mm-hmm. by people that go what happens to them what the the animals that die aren't really you don't hear about that because I discovered that two of the animals I was interested in had passed away they said the, the year before without any explanation and the fact that they can spend 20, 30 years in that same, the same cage. I mean, so when people go and watch these animals for sort of 30 seconds or a minute for greyhounds or they pass by the zoo cage, maybe maximum 30 seconds. And yet the whole entirety of these animals' lives, mm. it's that, that mundaneness that I, that I want to explore. Yeah, that's that's one of you. I mean, it's it's tragic, actually, because when you start to just accumulate those hours, um, like you said, those moments of acute violence uh, and that fear, I think, are, are real and significant. But there is something crushing about just thinking, like you said, I, I remember as a child going to the zoo and seeing bears in the zoo and you could see just in that moment that the bear was not happy. I was a child, but I could tell just by the pacing of the bear. I didn't know anything about animal studies. Bear was just pacing up and down what was in effect a concrete square. So even when they're exposed to the public, the level of of interaction with other beings, um, any sort of, and I, I know it's a lot has changed in zoos since I was young, some zoos at least, but you add that up over a life and it starts to become just... I mean, we, we think now about COVID and how people have started to feel a little bit bonkers when they're told to stay in home for two weeks. Now imagine being, uh, you know, an intelligent being kept in a concrete square, not for 30 seconds, not for a day, but for 30 years. It's it's beyond imagination. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So it was that kind of experience of, of the, the psychological and ontological violence that, that I wanted to bring out because um, I think it's just as significant as mm. as the, the the physical violence, um, okay. especially for, for for prolonged for prolonged times, and often the other aspect of of is the continual what we would 
describe what, what some studies might describe as the lovely relations, say, with, with horses or with dogs. For many animals, those relationships are, are, are severed continually and maybe several times in their lives. Um, they get passed from different owners or they get abandoned and get adopted again. So I guess that 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 trajectory of their lives that mm. we also don't see from their perspective. No, I mean, I know um, my own doggo, Linus, we adopted him when he was 11 months. Still a, mm. still, a, still a youngster, right? 11 months is... And he had been in four different homes, four or five different homes before he reached us at 11 months. And you've just got to think what underlies that kind of assumption that you can just get rid of. Um, and, and I do think maybe folks don't always have a, a clear understanding of the responsibility involved in having another being in your life and, and uh, you know, the money and the time and the dedication and that this being is a person in your family now and you need to take responsibility for them. But the ease with which people will introduce pets into their home to only get rid of them when they become a nuisance or a problem, uh, I think, I can't remember what study I read, but I think it happens often around Easter. Everyone decides to go and buy a bunny rabbit because it's Easter. And then shortly thereafter, there are just rabbits being donated to to welfare organizations because people don't want them anymore. They realize that a rabbit's not an ornament. They have needs and wants and things they'd like to do. Um, anyway, yeah, it's, no, uh, that's exactly right. That's the kind of it's some of that. Those are the kind of ways that we use animals that I think are morally less visible. They they do get um, uh, what's the word accepted a lot a lot more. Yeah, yeah they're a bit more sidelined. Um, mm. Though, yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for all of the work you've done and the work you continue to do. I will definitely keep reading your papers and I hope to uh, keep our conversations going. Uh, if folks want to reach out to you, uh, do you have an email address or are you on Twitter or anything like that? Um, yes, I'm on email. Um, it's my surname and my initial. It's p at edgehill.co.uk. Um, I am on Twitter, but I'm not a, an active Twitterer. I just have it mainly to do work things. Okay. And it's it's Rainfed5, uh, at Rainfed5 is my Twitter handle. But, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a big social media person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm figuring out most guests aren't. Everyone kind of ends off with saying, I need to get better at it, but it's not my priority, which I think is yeah. totally fine. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining me today and for what was really – a great conversation. Um, I, I learned a lot from you and uh, I really look forward to talking to you more in future. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, no, it was really, I really loved talking to you and um, yeah, I hope I got across some decent ideas. Welcome to the Animal Highlight. In today's highlight, I'm going to be talking about rats. But before I start rambling about how amazing rats are, I thought I'd read a short excerpt from the book Flies, Bedbugs, Cockroaches and Rats, Pests in the City by Dawn Day Beeler. One of her chapters is focused entirely on rats and the opening, the opening page of this chapter is kind of an excerpt about rats during the Great Depression in the United States. Okay, here we go. This is my first time ever reading on a podcast, so wish me luck. A Norway rat emerged from his burrow as dusk fell over Baltimore's east side on an early spring evening in 1937. The air carried a scent of food as well as scents of people, dogs and cats. The high board wooden fence surrounding the backyard provided reliable shelter from these minor threats despite its ramshackle condition, perhaps because of it. The rat's grey-brown fur brushed against the fence as he trotted along it, retracing the greasy line left a few inches above the ground by generations of his kin. He poked his nose under the fence, testing the space with his sensitive whiskers. His whiskers barely grazed the boards, signalling to him that he had more than enough room to pass through. On the other side, the rat found the neighbour's back stairs, atop which sat a bucket of kitchen scraps, its contents lean in these hard times, waiting to be dumped in a busted wooden barrel by the alley. The rat had seen this bucket there before. If he had not, he would have approached much more tentatively. His wariness serves him well. New objects in the environment could be traps or poisons. <laughs> 
One of the larger rats on the block, he easily reached the first step with his front paws and bounded up crooked wooden stairs until he reached the bucket and tipped it over. Another large male rat joined him, and the two licked juice from crab shells and nibbled at the tiny scraps of meat left inside. Suddenly, the light came on in the kitchen, and a small dog barked from inside the back screen door. Startled, the rats reared up and squealed. The dog retreated, and the rats fled. They jumped down to the ground, scurried across the yard, and squeezed under the fence and into the alley. Many of the block's 200-some rats departed their burrows after sunset to eat, drink, and mate. Across the alley, a pregnant female lapped at a tub where rain had collected during the morning shower. She had given birth to five litters of six to nine young in the past year, but many of her pups died from disease, starvation, or predation. A young rat peeked out from under the rotted and gnawed bottom of a privy shed door and ducked back inside upon seeing a cat peering down from the back porch. Large adult rats had little to fear from dogs or cats, however. Another young rat gnawed with her strong jaws and ever-growing teeth at the edges of a hole in the wooden platform of the back porch, enlarging the hole just enough to squeeze inside. Several rats made their homes in the house's cavity walls, rotting floors, and crumbling cellar. They enjoyed better access to stored food than their outdoor cousins, for the pantry consisted of open shelving without cabinet doors. They also transmitted fleas, mites, parasites, and bacteria to one another more easily than their backyard cousins. Indoor rats faced more frequent confrontations with human residents, which often proved fatal for rats and sometimes injurious, infectious, or deadly to people. So I really just love uh, that excerpt because it places rats at the center of that urban story and you kind of get a sense and a feel for how rats navigate the city, what they're doing in their day-to-day -day lives, what their schedules are, um, who their families are. So with, with that in mind, here are some just interesting facts about rats. So rats are primarily nocturnal animals. Their teeth never stop growing. Their whiskers are extremely sensitive, and uh, one of my favorite words of all time is thigomaxic, which means that they brush along, uh, they use their whiskers or their bodies to brush along walls to get a sense of the place. They have amazing senses. So rats' eyes can move in opposite directions. Uh, they have an exceptional sense of smell. In fact, they have over a thousand olfactory receptors. To, to give you a sense of what that means, humans only have about 400, whereas and dogs have just over 800. So because of this, rats have been used in a variety of uh, settings. They've been used to work in clearing landmines in Mozambique, Cambodia, Zimbabwe, and Angola. And they've also been found to more quickly and more accurately identify TB than those working in a lab. And above all else, rats are extremely social animals. They live in small groups, they mourn the death of someone in their group. They, they're prone to depression if they don't have friends. And they're also prone to peer pressure. And they and cleaning is a really important social bond. So even though people think rats are really dirty, in fact, they're extremely clean. And they'll spend hours and hours a day just cleaning one another. So, yeah, there are some really interesting facts and tidbits about rats. They are animals you don't necessarily see every day when you're walking in the city. Or maybe you do, I don't know. But uh, I hope that you now think of rats as being much, much more than an animal that is associated with the bubonic plague. They have long, long histories stretching much further back than the, the Great Depression. And they just got a lot of interesting stuff going on. All right, that's it, everybody. Uh, thank you once again to Paula Kari for being a fantastic guest, to Animals and Philosophy, Politics, Law and Ethics, Apple for sponsoring this podcast, to Jeremy John for the logo, and Gordon Clark for the bed music. This is The Animal Turn with me, Claudia Hotenfelder. <laughs>